Christmas. I am certainly excited about Christmas, and I pray that you're excited about it too. Christmas is different for different people. It, it's a wonderful time of year for the majority of people, but there are also many people that have a very real struggle during the Christmas holidays, and I know that everybody has a different outlook at what, at what Christmas is when it comes to the Christmas season. And I hope that your Christmas is a wonderful Christmas. I hope that my Christmas is a wonderful Christmas, and I know that it will be. But I want to challenge us this morning, as we come here on Christmas Eve, and we prepare to celebrate the birth of our Lord tomorrow morning, I want to challenge us this morning to remember something. Because all of the traditions that we have at Christmas are good traditions. There's nothing wrong with tradition. Traditions are fun. Traditions are interesting. But what I want to challenge you to do is not to get rid of your Christmas traditions. What I do want to challenge you to do, however, is to keep your focus in the right place. It is fun to celebrate all that we celebrate at Christmas, but none of that is meaningful apart from what Christmas is truly about. The central focus of Christmas is not presents. The central focus of Christmas is not turkey or ham, or even spending time with family, as wonderful as that may be. But the central focus of Christmas is Jesus and Jesus alone. Amen. We tend to treat Jesus like a story much of the time. We look forward to opening gifts, and we look forward to getting to the Christmas meal, and as I've said before, we tack on a five-minute devotional about Jesus at the end of our Christmas celebration, and we say that we made it all about Christ. But Jesus is much more than a story. As I heard one preacher say a while back, Jesus is the axis upon which every human destiny turns. Christmas is a very big deal. Jesus is the object of Christmas. And not only is he the object of Christmas, Jesus should be the object of our greatest and our deepest and our strongest loyalty and affection. And as we look at John chapter 1, we're going to look at John 1.14 this morning. We're going to stick to this one verse because this one verse has so much to say about Christmas so we're not going to go beyond that today like we normally would. But as we look at John 1, 14, I want to ask the question, why do we really celebrate Christmas? Is it for the joy in, in being with people that we love? Is it, is it for the purpose of having fun together and giving things and being charitable? And oh, also thinking about Jesus. Why do we celebrate Christmas? Well, John answers that for us in John chapter 1, verse 14. And I want to point out two things about Christmas from this verse this morning. Number one, I want to point out what Christmas is truly about. And number two, I want to point out why Christmas is so important to us. So if you have any doubts about why we celebrate Christmas, if you have any doubts about what it means, or if you have any confusion about why that is important to us, then look no further than John 1.14, because John tells us all of that right here. So we look at John 1.14 this morning. <clears throat> I want to begin by discussing what Christmas is really about. This first phrase that we come across in verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh. Do you realize that is the... That is what Christmas is about. That is the meat and potatoes of Christmas. That is the, the meaning of the Christmas event, that the Word became flesh. We talk about the baby being more born in the manger. We look at our nativity sets and we think about what a wonderful story it is that, that Christ the babe was born and he was placed in a manger. But Christmas is not about a baby in a manger. Christmas is about God becoming man. Christmas is about the Word becoming flesh. Whenever John says the Word became flesh, it's very important that we understand what he means when he says the Word, isn't it? We talked about that last week as we looked at, at John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. 
where it says the beginning in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God who is the word the word is none other than God himself the one who was before the manger the one who was before the creation of the heavens and the earth the one who was before all things he is the God through whom all things were created that were created Anything that was created was created by this one who is referred to as the Word. He is absolutely God in every way. He is the creator of the universe. He is the one who existed before time. He is the one who is not only with God, but he himself is God. And we are told in verse 14 that this Word becomes flesh. He goes on to reveal to us in verse 18 that this word is none other, none other than Jesus Christ himself. So when the word, when the Bible talks about the word in John chapter 1, he's referring to Jesus. And not only is he the God of creation, but he is also the one who became flesh. The God of heaven has stepped into human flesh. Now I want you to stop and think for a minute what that means. Think for a minute what kind of an impact that should have on us. The God of heaven has stepped into human flesh. The word became flesh. Without these words, there is no such thing as Christianity. You realize that? There is no Christian faith without the word becoming flesh. The word becoming flesh is what separates our faith from every other faith of the world. We don't just believe in a God who created the heavens and the earth and just set back to, to watch it work on its own. We believe in a God who is intimately involved with his people, who loved people enough that did not deserve to be with him, to enter into human flesh, to do for them what they could not do for themselves. This is what makes Christianity Christianity. This is what makes Christmas Christmas. The fact that the Word, God Himself, became flesh. Now let me stop for a moment and point something out. When John tells us that the Word became flesh, he does not mean that he stopped being God and all of a sudden became man. I can see how some people might think, well, he was God at one point and now he becomes man. Or he was God, and now he's God and man, so he was 100% God, and now he's half God and half man. But I want you to know that that's not the picture that is painted here. That's not the picture that is presented in the Bible. This is not the word that we see. He is not part God, part man. He is not 50-50. He is 100% God. He never stopped being God. I want you to realize that when the Bible tells us the Word became flesh, it means in no way that he ever put aside any of his attributes or any of his qualities of God. He never stepped out of those. He may have chosen not to exercise those for a period of time, but he never stopped being God. There was nothing about who he was that was diminished in every way. As a matter of fact, instead of having something taken away from him when he stepped into the human race, he had something added, didn't he? He's been God from before creation. He's been God from eternity past. But now, not only is he God, he is both God and man. Nothing was taken away. But something was very definitely added. And that's what we're celebrating at Christmas time. The fact that God became flesh. I know that he is speaking of this. Because the word is the subject of this sentence. This is the word who was from all time, from the beginning of all time that he mentions in verse 1. And as we look at the fact that the word became flesh, I want you to know that Christmas is not just about a babe that is lying in a manger. Christmas is about a savior and a king. Christmas is not just about an infant that was brought into this world to be the king of the Jews. Christmas is about the God of all creation stepping into human flesh.
to be the king over all peoples that trust him, of every tongue and every tribe and every nation. That's what Christmas is about. It's about deity. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God meeting humanity. The Word became flesh. As the Word of God, He is the one who created everything. He is the one who existed before everything. He is the one to whom all glory belongs. And as the one who became flesh, he is one who has experienced life as a man experiences life. He has felt hunger as we experience hunger. He has felt pain as we experience pain. He has also bled just as we believe. Both of these things must be true for Christmas to have its meaning. He is not only God, he is also man. He is not half of one and half of the other, but he is fully each. And he has experienced each to the fullest measure. Now, the question that I ask is, what is the result of God becoming flesh? What happens when the God of the universe, who speaks the world into existence through his word, decides to step into human flesh? Well, John says in verse 14 that when the Word became flesh, He dwelt among us. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So what is it that happens when God becomes flesh? Well, what happened when the Creator of the universe stepped into a human body is that He dwelled among people. Very literally, this passage reads, and the Word became flesh and tabernacle among us. And we've talked about that many times in here, but whenever we think about it in those terms, it takes on a whole new meaning. Where was it among the Old Testament people of Israel that people would go to experience the glory of God? Where was it that God's presence was manifested? Where was it that the glory of God was most recognizable? Not just within the people of Israel, not just within the camp of Israel, but within a certain tent within the camp of Israel, known as the tabernacle. Not only within that tent, but in the most holy place within that tent, where the glory of God was manifested. And the tabernacle is what the people of God associated with when they thought of the glory of God. And if God was going to dwell among his people, he did so through the tabernacle. When anybody thought about God dwelling among his people, the tabernacle would be the very first thing that would come to mind. The tabernacle was a dwelling place. But specifically, in Israel, the tabernacle was a dwelling place for God. And now, John speaks of Jesus. And he tells us that he is the God of the universe. And if that is not enough for us to try to comprehend, he tells us that this God stepped into human flesh, and now he has tabernacled with us. So the idea is the God of the universe, who once dwelt with his people in this tent, now dwells with his people through Jesus Christ. Christmas is wonderful. Christmas has meaning. Because God has come to dwell with his people, and he has done so in Jesus himself. As the Christmas carol says, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus, our Emmanuel, Jesus is God with us. So we ask the question, what is Christmas all about? It is about God being with us. It is not about anything else. It is not about our traditions. It's not about our families. It's not about any of the wonderful things that we do and experience or open on Christmas Day. It is all about God being with us through Jesus Christ. Now I want to ask the question, why is that so important to us? We know what it's about. The Christmas event is about Jesus being born. It's about God stepping into human flesh and 
because he stepped into human flesh, he dwelt with his people. He is able to be experienced among his people through Jesus Christ. Now, why does that mean anything to you? Why does it mean anything to me? Well, let's think about that for a minute. Let's look at what John says. He says that the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And then he goes on to tell us that we beheld his glory. You see that in verse 14? When the word became flesh, he dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. Why is Christmas important to us? Why is it important to us that God became man? Well, the first reason is this, because God became man. In the man that he became, we can behold his glory like we could in no other way. We are able to see the splendor of God. What does glory mean? Isn't it, it the, the, the radiance, the splendor, the magnificence, the, the worth and the value of God as it is being displayed out from him? And we are able to see that. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Why is that important to us? It's important. For this reason, because the word of God has dwelt among us bodily in the form of Jesus Christ, we can see the glory of God in him. We can see God's glorious radiance. We can see his glorious splendor. You know, we talked about the tabernacle a moment ago. That, that was how God manifested his presence among his people. There were people thought about God dwelling with his people. They would think about it in the form of the tabernacle. But you did know, if you read throughout the story of the Old Testament, you will see that the people of God continue to be unfaithful time after time after time after time. And after being given uh, a, an innumerable, it seems to be, amount of opportunities, they continue to turn their back on God. They continue to, to bow down to idols. And they continue to rebel against the God that they were created to worship. As a matter of fact, at one point it got so bad that after the people of God had been taken into exile that the glory of God departed from the temple. The prophet Ezekiel tells us about that. Can you imagine what God's people must have thought when not only has, as a matter of fact, when Ezekiel talks about the temple being destroyed, uh, where he talks about Jerusalem being destroyed. There's not even much mention right there of the temple. And I think that's because the glory had already departed by that point. Can you imagine how God's people must have felt? You're the people of God. You're known by your association with Him. He is the one in whom your hope lies. If there is any future for you, it's going to be through Him. But now His glory has departed. How do we come before Him? How do we see Him? How do we experience him? Because where we went to experience God, he is no longer. He is not there. And the people of God are waiting to see the glory of God. They want to see the glory of God. And they're crying out to be able to experience his glory. And after God's glory had departed his people, when it left the temple that Ezekiel speaks of, we see that his glory has been made visible to us. It's come back to dwell among us. It is experienced by us in the one whose name is Jesus. There was a long time that people could not see the glory of God, but we can. We can see it. We can experience it. We can know it because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld, we saw His glory. You know, when John says that we saw His glory, I don't think he's speaking specifically or limiting himself to what people could see with the physical eyes. Well, we could see the brightness of, of Jesus as it was displayed from heaven. We can see his radiance across the universe. I don't think that's exactly what John means. I think he means much more than that. 
When we behold the glory of God, it's much more than the brightness of God radiating, radiating out through the universe. We're not just seeing here with physical eyes, we're seeing with spiritual eyes. We're able to take in the, the wonder of who God is, at least to the degree that He has made us capable of. We're able to, to see how wonderful He is. We're able to experience Him and who He is. And we're only able to see that through Jesus Christ or experience that through Jesus Christ. I want you to see what he says about God's glory as we see it in Jesus. Why is Christmas so important to us? It's important because through the one who became flesh, we are able to behold the glory of God. And look at what it says about this glory. We beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, what kind of glory is it that we are beholding? Or what is it about God's glory that we are able to see, that we are able to behold, and that we are able to experience? We're able to see that His glory is full of grace. And we're able to see that His glory is full of truth. How do I know that? Because John says it. We're able to behold His glory. What glory? Glories of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Whenever the Bible says that His glory is full of grace and truth, I want you to stop and consider what it means that when God became flesh and we beheld His glory, that that glory is filled with grace. Do you know that's why we can have joy at Christmas? It's one thing to recognize who God is through Jesus Christ. But to be able to experience His blessings, well, that only, that only comes because His glory is full of grace. You do understand that, don't you? That if there's anybody here that does not know what grace means, let me just tell you, grace means being given a gift that you did not earn. It's the flip side of the coin for mercy. Mercy is not being given that terrible thing that you have earned. You're not receiving the punishment that you deserve. While grace is, I am receiving a gift that I don't deserve. And so when we read in the Bible, in the Bible, that God's glory, as we behold it in Jesus, is full of grace and truth, we need to realize that the coming of God into man was so that he could be gracious toward us. His glory is gracious. We deserve to be separated from him for all of eternity. We all are criminals based on the very acts that we perform, based on where our hearts lead us, based on where our actions take us. We have all turned against God. We have none of us merited God's favor. I know it's real easy at Christmas time to think, well, I have done pretty good this year. I, I should be on the nice list and not the naughty list this year. But you know, the idea behind it all is that every one of us are naughty. There's not one of us that deserves God's presence among us. There's not one of us that deserves to experience and behold the glory of God. But because God's glory is full of grace, He has given us something that we don't deserve. Why was Jesus born? He was born as a baby who was placed in a manger so that He could grow up and die as a man who was placed on a cross. Christmas is significant because it is what leads to the cross. Christmas is significant because God had to become man if He was going to die on the cross. As God, He is worthy in every way. As God, we owe Him our allegiance. And we owe Him our loyalty. But as man, He died in our place. As man, He took upon the, sacri the sacrifice of Himself for the punishment that we deserve. As a man, He was the one that paid the price. As God, He's the only one who was worthy. Christmas is about God's grace.
The only way that we can have joy at Christmas is to realize the purpose for which Jesus came. And that was to show grace toward sinners. He was born as a baby so that he could die as a man. And therefore, God's grace would abound to sinners like you and me. People who have lied, people who have stolen, and people who have turned our backs on God. And just when we think we're good enough, that proves to us that we are not. When you think that you've been good enough to, to make yourself onto God's nice list this year, that just proves that you don't understand who He is. That just proves that you think little of His character. That if you, a sinner, could get close to a holy God, then that God must not be very holy. But He is holy because in His grace, He did for us what we could not do for ourselves. And in sacrificing His Son who was born to die, He took upon Himself our sin, our crimes against Him, so that we might be able to stand before Him as spotless. And when God lets me into His heaven, He's not going to say, Scott, I had to lower the bar to let you in. If He were to let me in the way that I was born, yes, He would he wouldn't even lower the bar. He'd have to put it way down under the ground. But I can stand before God, and he's not going to say, Scott, I had to lower the bar for you to get you up here. There's a really close fit, but you made it. That's not what he's going to say to me. He's going to look at me as spotless, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus did for me and because of what Jesus did for you. God did not lower the standard of heaven to let us in. That's why Jesus came. So God could lift us up to that standard, not so that that standard may be lowered. He is a God whose glory we see in this baby, a glory that is full of grace and a glory that is full of truth. He was true to himself. He was true to the character of God. He was true to the fact that God's holiness and God's character could not be compromised. But he's also true to us. He's true to all of those who trust in him. He is the standard of truth. He is the God of glory. And he is full of grace and truth. And as you wake up tomorrow morning to celebrate Christmas Day, I want you to have the very best Christmas possible. Now here's the question. You want a good Christmas? Anybody want a good Christmas this year? Hopefully. Hey, could I hear an amen if anybody? Amen. Anybody want a good Christmas? Now who wants the best Christmas this year? Amen. I don't want you to have a good Christmas. I want you to have the very best possible Christmas that you could ever have. A good Christmas is not good enough. As a matter of fact, Outside of the best Christmas, no other Christmas is really good at all. Now, you may wake up tomorrow morning and you may break in the gifts. You may get that one thing that you've wanted all year long. People may give you more than you've ever asked for. You may have the opportunity tomorrow to see family that you haven't seen in a long time. And you may be so excited about the time that you get to stay with them. Maybe you're thinking, that's what's going to make Christmas good. All of the things that I'm going to open, it's going to make Christmas great. All of my family being around me. Oh, and don't forget the meal that we're going to eat. And we put all of those things together. Oh, Christmas just couldn't be better, could it? Oh, but it could. I don't want you to have a good Christmas. I want you to have the best Christmas. What is it that makes Christmas the very best that you could possibly have? John tells us in verse 14, beholding the glory of God who became flesh for us. That is what makes Christmas great. That is what makes Christmas the best. So as you wake up tomorrow morning and you look at your tree, and you look at your presents, and you look at your family, and you look at all of the food, my prayer is that you will behold Jesus. 
My prayer is that you look past those things, that those things aren't the focal point for you tomorrow, but that what you behold is much greater than those things that are under your tree or sitting around your tree, but that you may behold none other than Jesus himself, that you may look up unto him and see him in all of his glory, that you may experience him for who he is, that you may trust him for what he's done. And in doing that, you may have the best Christmas that you could ever possibly have. My prayer is that you will have the best Christmas. And in doing so, that Jesus will be the object of your greatest and your deepest 